Uh, our theme has been workforce training this session, and so we're very satisfied with that. The governor tells us his view of how the legislative session is going so far. At Issue starts right now. Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Wilson Stribling. Welcome to another edition of At Issue, where we discuss and debate the critical issues facing the state of Mississippi and how these issues impact you. And we want you to share your opinions and comments with us. Just go to facebook.com slash MPB online news. On Twitter, our handle is at issue MPB. Also visit our webpage, mpbonline.org. We are now seven weeks into the 2015 legislative session. Many big issues like education and taxes are still alive in the House and Senate. At Issues, Paul Boger spoke with Governor Phil Bryant about how he thinks the session has gone so far. Well, we've been encouraged. Uh, we've been very successful in moving forward about $50 million without hurting the general fund out of our uh, reserve on unemployment that will not be used because unemployment rates are dropping. So we'll use that for workforce training. We're looking at a $3 million scholarship program for those that are in work tech programs that will be able to move forward into a training program in a community college. So uh, our theme has been workforce training this session, and so we're very satisfied with that. I was disappointed to see the House has basically done away with the third grade gate, the literacy program, put that off for a year. I hope the Senate will take a very close look at that before we move forward. We've got to work hard at making sure we provide schools with the uh, equipment and necessary training they need to make sure these children are adequately prepared to go to the fourth grade. What about some things that you haven't seen the legislature done so far? Uh, is there something that you wish they had done that they haven't yet? Not really. I mean, I think you'll see, again, about $100 million, maybe $106, $110 million put into education, more than last year. The second portion of the teacher pay raise is something that's very important to us. Also adding uh, teacher assistance to that pay raise, so that, uh, that will be important for us. Uh, the one thing that I am disappointed in there was a bill, uh, Representative Mark Formby asked for, uh, to put on the ballot for a constitutional amendment to add a balanced budget to the Mississippi Constitution. It's not in the Constitution, it's in a code section. And unfortunately, uh, that died on the House floor. Remarkable that members of the legislature would take away the citizens' right to vote on a balanced budget in Mississippi, but that's exactly what they did. We also spoke with two Democrats, Representative Latasha Jackson and Representative Kevin Horan, to get their thoughts on the session. I'll say we've had a progressive session with some controversial issues, as we've had before, especially with the Literacy Promotion Act and the amendment to House Bill 745. Um, we've seen some increase in funding for MAEP but we have still underfund education. So we do have some things that we're still working on. I agree with that. We, you know, we made an effort uh, to provide some pay increase to our teachers. Uh, I think that the Republicans, uh, because the Democrats uh, offered up a $5,000 pay raise, gave a $2,500 pay raise, but it was only after the prodding of the Democrats that introduced that legislation. We've had some issues about the balanced budget amendment. There's been a lot of talk about that. But we've had a pretty good session so far. Uh, the balanced budget amendment is something that uh, they offered up, the Republican leadership did, but it's really doing nothing that we haven't already done since the statute was enacted in 1920, requiring that we not spend money that we haven't, uh, that we don't have. Uh, this balanced budget amendment uh, that they they offered is doesn't offer anything new. In fact, we uh, the Democrats offered an amendment that basically said to eliminate deficit spending, uh, but uh, that uh, that failed, and uh, some of us felt like that that needed to pass to put some teeth into the legislation to make sure that if that was the intent uh, of the legislation to make sure we had a true balanced budget, that eliminating deficit spending would have done that, and the amendment that we proposed. Uh, would have done that. A Jackson attorney and small business owner wants to be the first female governor of Mississippi. Please put your hands together and join me in welcoming the next and first woman governor of the great state of Mississippi, Vicki Slater. 
Vicki Slater will run as a Democrat for the state's top office. She called out Governor Bryant, saying he has failed on the critical issues like health care, jobs, corruption, and education. Today we start the difficult but incredibly important work of saving our beloved state of Mississippi from the forces that are wrecking it. I stand here today to ask every citizen of this state to join us in that work. Together we can build the Mississippi we all deserve. Today we start to write a new future for our state. Let's be clear about something. The problems of Mississippi are not the fault of the hardworking people of Mississippi. They are the fault of Mississippi's failed leadership. There can be no argument that government is morally obligated to educate its children, keep its citizens safe, look out for those who cannot look out for themselves, and be good stewards of the taxpayer's money. I am running for governor because Phil Bryant has failed to meet those obligations. Slater is 58 years old. This is her first run for political office. Well, a member of the House has apologized for making racially charged comments in an article published in the Clarion Ledger. Representative Gene Alday addressed his colleagues in the House about it this week. said in a Clarion Ledger article on education, quote, I come from a town where all the blacks are getting food stamps and what I call welfare crazy checks. They don't work, end quote. We spoke with Governor Bryant, Representative Robert Johnson, and House Speaker Pro Tem Greg Snowden about those comments and all day's apology. Well, of course, we condemn any statement like that in Mississippi. Those days are long past. Uh, you just cannot go about making those kind of statements and not think that you're going to be held accountable for it. It's very unfortunate. Um, I don't know him very well personally, but uh, it, there is just no room in Mississippi today for any type of comment related to individuals because of their race. I was offended by it, and I'm sure many other people in Mississippi were. His, uh, his apologies seem to be heartfelt. I take a man at his word. Uh, but I think as we've continued to say, uh, the thing that concerns, that concerns us is that Alday, uh, Representative Alday may be a reflection of, of uh, an, an undertone in the legislature uh, given the, the string of uh, pieces of legislation that we've seen passed or the lack of action on things that need to, need to happen. And so the most important thing that could happen right now from Mr. Alday and from everyone else involved or everyone else around us is that we take an action that creates a record that says something different than what Mr. Alday said. Action speaks louder than words. Wanted to get your thoughts on uh, Representative Alday's comments and, and his uh, apology today. Well, I thought he was contrite uh, and appropriately so. I mean, he said some bad things that he acknowledged and, um, you know, tried to repair his relationships with members of the House. I hope he was successful. Do you think uh, those, those comments you know, there's there's concerns from other representatives that they may have, a, sh they may show an underlying problem here in the House. Do you think that's true? No, I don't. If if the suggestion is there's some sort of inherent racism in the leadership or the majority party, then I adamantly reject that. I think you see the comments from the governor, certainly see the comments from the speaker condemning the substance of his remarks. Uh, I do not think that's uh, the case at all. Now, having said that, you can't defend the substance of Representative Alday's remarks, and he didn't try to do that today. As I said, he was contrite and uh, basically asked for forgiveness and apologized, which I think certainly he needed to do. 
Well, each week during the legislative session, we debate and exchange ideas with representatives from the Republicans and the Democrats. We call it the At Issue Roundtable. Brandon Jones is a Democrat serving four years in the Mississippi House of Representatives from 2008 to 2012. He currently is the executive director of a political action committee called the Mississippi Democratic Trust. He's an attorney at the Beria Williamson Law Firm and has degrees from Mississippi College, Wake Forest University, and Mercer University. Austin Barber is a Republican. He was a senior advisor for the Senator Thad Cochran campaign. He's the founding partner of Clearwater Group and a graduate of Ole Miss. Gentlemen, as always, we're glad you're with us. Thanks for having us. Let's start with Representative Alday. Uh, uh, Austin, do you think his apology was was necessary and appropriate? Oh yeah, certainly necessary. Uh, I, no one could defend what he had to say. Uh, I'm glad to see that he apologized. Hope that um, we can move on from this. But he needed to apologize. He's certainly been soundly rebuked by Brandon by just about every Republican that I've heard right. talk about him, whether it's the governor, the speaker, and others who have, uh, you know, as I said, soundly rebuked his comments. And I'm um, glad to see that he apologized, and he'll certainly need to continue to mend fences. But look, this is an election year. Voters will get to decide how they feel about what he had to say, and I, I think that's what's most important is to let the voters decide. And really, there was an effort to say that the, that that uh, opinions like that, mindsets like that, affect legislation. Do you think that's a fair statement? Well, opinions affect legislation. Make no doubt about it. <clears throat> but I think there are sometimes when remarks are so far off the beaten path, are so severe that more than words is necessary. And I think this is one of those moments. Probably Mr. Alday needs to be stripped of his vice chairmanship. He probably should be censured. The rules of the House allow for that under Rule 20. Uh, one of my favorite sportscasters, Bill Simmons, was suspended for ESPN for saying a bad thing about Roger Goodell. Certainly this rises to that important. He shouldn't be having a mid-management position in the House when he says things like this. All right, let's move on to the race for governor. Uh, Vicki Slater was announced as a, a announced her candidacy as a as a Democrat for governor. Uh, Brandon is, uh, I think the the response from a lot of people was Vicki who. This is someone that a lot of people are not familiar with. A lot of Mississippians will recall that when the first Republican who was elected after a long time without having a Republican governor, Kirk Fordyce, not many folks knew who he was. I think that Vicki's a fresh face. She's running against a career politician, Phil Bryant, who has done very little other than take checks from the government for government jobs since he came out of school. So with a quick deviation to the deputy sheriff's office, I know that. But I think we're talking about somebody who's fresh with new ideas and her speech centered on a few things that I think will resonate. Governor Bryant stopped Mississippi from having its own health care exchange for purely political reasons. He has waged war on our public education system by deep-sixing a petition that was signed by thousands across the state. And he has a record that shows 40,000 fewer jobs today than in 2007 and has done very little to stem that tide. I just look at, at my friend over here across the table and think, is this silly season? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Listen, uh, Vicki Slater did a very nice job reading a speech that maybe Brandon wrote for her. I do not know. I know he's a very talented writer. Um, but look, you know, she read a speech. You know, congratulations to her for running for governor. It'll be maybe somewhat of an interesting race. Um, you know, Phil Bryant is well prepared to run this race. But where does this lady stand? I mean, where is she uh, on gun rights issues? Where is she on abortion? Where is she on taxes? Where is she on expanding entitlements? Um, and where is she on those issues? Only thing that I know is, uh, is that she has given a lot of money to Barack Obama. A lot of political contributions, thousands of dollars has she given to President Obama. We know where President Obama stands on these issues. Are, is, is she going to be in the corner of Barack Obama or is she not? We've got a full year to watch her campaign. We have a full year to watch uh, our governor campaign. I think he's done a fantastic job uh, as governor, bringing jobs, uh, lowering taxes. But um, she did a nice job reading a speech that maybe Brandon wrote for her, but we'll see how she does this year. I, you know, I think it's funny. Republicans always want to go to things like contributions or who, it who stood by they who. Do. Um, who you support What if matters. we took, what if we took count matters. of all the people who Phil Bryant backed up that are now serving time? or who are facing investigation. Well, have to, you'd have to get, I mean, you'd have to you get know, some examples there. That's a pretty serious allegation. Well, the DMR, we don't have to go any further than that. I mean, if we're going to do guilt by association, there are some very substantive ways to do that. And who you support in your personal political life, maybe it has relevance. But look, Vicki is going to have a plenty of time to kind of voice out she who she is and, and where she stands. And I think one thing, Austin, 
even you may find refreshing is that I think you'll get direct answers. I think she'll good. say it and then people will be able to weigh it. Well, we have some time and hopefully both will agree to debate the issues in a public forum. And oh, we can hear from We can hear from both of them. I'm sure they will. And she, is, should we assume that she is the Democrats' candidate? I mean, the, the, the deadline is not upon us yet. We haven't had a primary yet, but uh, there were a lot of uh, high-powered Democrats standing behind her when she made her announcement. Well, that's correct. And as Austin knows, we all have to be careful in what we do about presuming anything. There mm -hmm. still is a week. A lot of things can happen. But I, I think that she is the odds-on favorite for the nomination. I think that, you know, there was a particular interest in having a female in this role. So I think from that standpoint, Vicki being who she is and filling the role out in these last couple of days in the way that she has may satisfy what people were looking for. Time will tell. We'll see. There's a, a long campaign ahead, and uh, it's just getting started. All right, let's talk about the, the this week at the legislature. Uh, Austin, any surprises or things that caught that, that, that caught your eye this well, week? Well, Wilson, I think one of the things that we wanted to try to talk about is what has the legislature done so far that's surprising. And I think under the leadership of our Lieutenant Governor Tate Reeves and then strong leadership from our speaker this week, we have seen, of course, education spending um, is going to be uh, funded at a record level. The Senate's plans about $110 million, uh, $110 million. The House, of course, passed unanimously. When has that ever happened? $106 million more dollars for K-12 education than last year. Record funding. So congratulations to the speaker. I know uh, Lieutenant Governor Reeves is very excited about this as well because he's been you know, obviously passionately on the record about wanting to do as much as he can for education. So that is sort of the big issue to me is to see that that passed unanimously from the House. And I'm sure uh, Lieutenant Governor Reeves and Chairman Gray Tolleson will warmly receive that. And I think those guys will get together pretty easily on and it. There wasn't a whole lot of debate about it either. Yeah, I mean, the, the real debate took place over the amendment. And <clears throat> this was all kind of predicate to that. This was all kind of the budget process. I, you know, bragging about making the biggest appropriation is kind of like bragging about population growth or the weather. I mean, budgets change and they expand. Our budget today is much greater than in 1903. I'm not sure that that gives you an objective comparison to people who were in office then. But the truth is we didn't do enough for our teachers. 5,000 was the benchmark set by Democrats. We came in at 2,500. We didn't do enough for state employees. Bo Eaton forcefully offered the amendment several times for $1,500. Herb Frierson and his associates cut it down to 1,000 with some regret. I don't think we would have gotten anything had it not been for Democrats leading the way, as Representative Horan said. But I mean, we look back at missed opportunities, but I think the reason that you saw at the end of the day people embrace that is because in this game you do negotiate as best as you can and then embrace what you can. Yeah, under Republican leadership, record funding for education. Pay raise for school teachers last year. Looks like there's going to be a pay raise for uh, assistant teachers this year under Republican leadership. I'd like to let that be the last word. Austin, Brandon, thank as you. always, thank you. Enjoyed our conversation. Help is on the way for law enforcement to help officers be trained to handle calls involving people with mental illness. The state is getting federal funding to pay for law crisis intervention training for law enforcement agencies. Mental health providers, local law officers and advocates gathered at the state capitol to make the announcement this week. Together to not only acknowledge those who join together to work together and assist in the mental health recovery process, with the CIT training, uh, an officer has, uh, I like to use the expression, additional tools in the toolbox. Uh, I believe most officers are about doing the right thing and about treating people with dign dignity and with respect. And many times officers uh, haven't been, up to now, really haven't received the training to understand that people who are in a mental health crisis don't choose to be that way. They didn't get up in the morning and say, well, today I, I want to have a psychotic episode. I want to go out and take my clothes off and run down the street. That, that is not, uh, you know, what they got up to do. But they have a mental health issue that they uh, are not being treated for. And because of uh, situations that happen in the community, many times law enforcement is the first one called when a situation uh, presents itself. And so these officers need to have the uh, education and the training so that they can resolve these issues in a safe manner for not only the individual with a mental health crisis, but for officers as well.
Joining us now to talk more about this crisis intervention training is Brent Hurley with the Department of Mental Health in Mississippi. Brent, we welcome you to the program. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about these crisis intervention teams. Essentially, right, what, what happens in a typical law enforcement situation where they have a call to someone who's, say, being disruptive? Uh, what does an officer in a typical situation, maybe who has not had this training, wh what are they to do with that person who might be a danger to themselves or somebody else? If they're a danger to themselves or someone else, typically an officer will remove them from the scene. And when they remove them from the scene, the only uh, venue that they have to take them to is the jail. So they'll put them under arrest for disturbing the peace or something like Correct. that. Take them to jail where obviously they're not getting any help for the condition that led to them doing whatever they did. Correct. So this training would then train officers to do what? It would train them to recognize mental illness uh, more efficiently. It, would, uh, it teaches them de-escalation techniques that officers don't typically get at the academy to intervene with someone who may be hearing voices or uh, having other issues. And to also connect them with mental health services and possibly de-escalate the, the situation on the scene and leave that person with a family member. So these are services that exist, it's just that the officers, the, the, the guys and, and the ladies out in the field haven't been trained on how to recognize and direct people to these programs? Exactly, yes. So tell us about how this money then will be used, this federal money. We have, uh, we've received some federal funding to train a, a, a maximum of 40 officers a year. Uh, for the next three years in 40 hours of specialized training, which is crisis intervention training, um, and so that they can take that information and uh, new learning back to their community and hopefully expand it within their own law enforcement agency. And the goal, I guess, is, is not only to handle the situation differently and to get the person the help they need, but ultimately that's better for the law enforcement agency, is it not? Because then they don't have these people in their jails who they're not equipped to deal with. It is, it is. The, the individual gets treatment at a mental health facility or a health facility. The law enforcement officers are more, uh, experience more officer safety and less incidents of uh, physical injury and it saves the taxpayers uh, money by not housing an individual in a correctional facility as opposed to getting treatment. So this funding and training already exists. You're just trying to get the word out to these law enforcement agencies if they want to send an officer or two to this. Actually, the training comes to them. They go to Lauderdale County, see how they're doing it, and then you provide the training to their people on their site. We could help them establish that, that same training curriculum and uh, location at their community with their community mental health center. Very good. Brent Hurley, we appreciate you coming on. Uh, useful me. information. Thanks. Now to some of your feedback on social media about lawmakers in the House voting to scrap the high school graduation test. Here's what some of you had to say. Martha Kane writes, agree, disagree, or indifferent. People need to start paying attention to what our elected officials are doing and voice their opinions about what's going on. One of the best ways to term is to term limit them by voting. You can't fix stupid, but you can vote the idiots out of office. Amelia Lauren Smith says, because really, what's the point? No one seems to care that national standardized tests are not race bias anyway. And Sherry Lynn Robinson says, they have to be kidding. How can they graduate without assessment? They might as well just say, hey, we don't think black people can pass the test, so we're lowering standards again. If we don't, it's racist. Really? It's racist to make sure someone knows what they need to in order to be a knowledgeable, functioning part of society? and get credit for what they know. They've been lowering standards since 1963 with the desegregation of the schools. Now we have high school grads who cannot even make correct change working at McDonald's. Some of your thoughts on some of what's been in the news. We are now joined by MPB's Paul Boger to talk about what he is hearing from lawmakers on this week's developments and what might be to come. Paul, good to have you with us. Thanks for being here. Uh, let's, uh, let's talk about um, a number of budgets that were passed, probably one of the most interesting. It was cosmetology. Cosmetology yeah. is not always in the news. Tell us what happened. No, no, it's not. The cosmetology board uh, was probably one of the most peculiar things I've seen in the state legislature. Uh, Steve Holland brought an amendment before the, the full body and voted to uh, defund the cosmetology board. Speaking to lawmakers afterwards, it's because they said it's because that the cosmetology board is notoriously bad at doing their job. Hmm. Two out of every three phone calls is about the cosmetology board, according two, to them. Two out of every th three phone calls they get as they legislators get, yeah, or complaints exactly about it. the cosmetology board. Yeah, it's incredibly interesting. Apparently just bad management, bad things. And this is a group of people who 
protect health. I mean, cosmetology can be a potentially dangerous thing. Chemicals are being mixed and put on people's bodies. You've so, got to regulate that. Uh, sure. And so by defunding them, I guess Representative Holland is, is trying to get their attention? Trying to send a little bit of a message. Hopefully they'll, they'll respond and, and get some money back, but we'll see. Okay, what else? Any other budget news? Uh, of that, course, uh, you know, education right. funding is always a big thing that happens. Uh, this year, the, the House voted to add about $106 million towards the MAEP, uh, Adequate Education Program. That does make it a record amount. That is more than the record amount of t uh, 2008, which was the high watermark. Uh, unfortunately, it still falls close to $200 million short of what the formula calls for. And that's what a lot of folks are trying to point out. Um, you know, the, they say, Republican lawmakers say that over the next couple of years, uh, they'll hopefully have MAEP funding at full, full levels. Uh, Democrats are saying they like to see it a little faster. Uh, of course, this will come down to the funding amendment that will appear on the ballot uh, in November. And education, sure, will be back uh, in the news next year, as it is every legislative session. All right, what else? Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor's tax cut plan is uh, still it's, making some news? It's making its way through the committee right now. They had a public hearing yesterday over the, uh, over the tax cuts. It's three different tax cuts. The main one focusing on the franchise tax. That will eliminate about $240 million in state revenue over 10 years, I believe. And that is a $2.50 tax on every $1,000 of capital a business may own. So that's very popular for business owners. Uh, Democrats, when, when I approach them for a remark on it, or whether they're going to support it or not, they're st they say they're still debating it. Uh, Demo or Republicans are in full favor of it. There's also uh, a, a measure to eliminate the, uh, the lowest uh, tax bracket, which could affect every Mississippian. We'll keep an eye on it. We know you will, too, at the Capitol. Paul Boger. We are out of time. We are glad you joined us for At Issue. We hope you'll join us again next week on MPB.